<clears throat> All right, so howdy. For the, those of y'all who don't know me, I'm Richard Bruton. And today I'm going to be talking about the development of a low cost. low-cost 3D phenotyping tool and its application in cassava. There we go. All right. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been at A&M since about 2007. So I got my bachelor's in natural resource management, uh, master's in ecosystem science and management, and now I'm here working on my PhD in plant breeding. In addition to my academic life, I uh, help my family manage a small family farm where we practice high density rotational grazing and we raise chickens on pasture. So, um, cassava origin is a, uh, originally from Latin America, but today it's considered a staple crop in many tropical areas of the world. Uh, it's harvested mainly <clears throat> for its starchy roots. Um, but the above ground portions of the plant are often used as like a livestock feed or even going into soups and stews, etc. Um, something that's kind of interesting about it is the roots have a lot of cyanide in them, which can be toxic. Uh, luckily, it's easily removed through boiling um, and soaking. So um, those, the starchy product is often used as a raw material for the food industry, so something you may have heard of is tapioca, so they make that from that starch. And then locals will often use it as a peeled vegetable. And then you also have some companies who will turn it into things like chips or flour or even different textiles. <coughs> Alright, so in our lab, one of the main questions that we're trying to answer is, can we find an above ground feature that will help us predict the below ground yield in cassava? So as a first step, I developed this, or we developed this low-cost 3D phenotyping platform to help us predict cassava biomass. So there are some major advantages to capturing phenotypic data in three dimensions. Um, it allows you to do accurate distance measures in 3D, so you can measure things like stem length or plant height. Uh, you can also determine angle measurements of things like leaves, stems, stalks. And you can also create complete 3D models, which will allow you to do things like estimate biomass or do yield, per, yield per, uh, determinations. However, the sensors that are traditionally used to do this are very costly. Um, the data collection and especially the analysis process is very time consuming. And a lot of these sensors are susceptible to different environmental conditions like wind or bright light. So as I kind of mentioned before, a lot of these sensors that we use are really expensive. So a lot of them are in excess of $100,000 if you want to buy a new. And to give you some examples, uh, a pre-owned Leica Scan Station 2 P40 terrestrial laser scanner is about $70,000. The original Velodyne 64 was $75,000. Uh, pre-owned Ferrofocus 120 terrestrial laser scanner costs you about $25,000 if you're going to buy one today. And um, the Velodyne Puck Light is $8,000. So luckily, there are some low-cost sensors that we can use to, to capture three-dimensional data. And most of these came from the gaming industry and the computer, computer vision industry. And they're known as depth sensors or RGBD sensors. Um, they're generally low-cost, so somewhere around $100 or $200 um, each. And they're widely available. So you can go get a lot of them at you know, Best Buy or definitely find them on Amazon. However, they're definitely not made for phenotyping and the vast majority of them don't function well outdoors. So these sensors use four different principles to operate. So um, the most basic is stereo. So you basically just take two passive sensors and triangulate to that object the distance. Then you have active stereo, which uses a very similar principle, but then also will project uh, structured light onto the scene, which will help in instances where there's not a lot of features to do that triangulization to. Then structured light uses um, just that projector with one camera and is relying solely on that structured light to make its distance measures. And then you have time of flight sensors which project laser light into the scene and they're measuring the time that it takes for that laser light to go from the sensor to the object and back. 
All right, so ultimately we decided to use the Microsoft Connect version 2 sensor. So this sensor has a, a generally good RGB camera on it. Um, it produces a, a uh, 512 by 424 depth image. It uh, has a range of about 0.5 to 4.5 meters depending upon the conditions that you're using it in. And it works at 850 nanometers. So these sensors definitely have some drawbacks though. Um, they don't work really well in very bright sunlight. Um, as I mentioned before, they kind of have a limited operating range. And one of the big problems is if you want to use more than one sensor, you actually get sensor to sensor interference. So this sensor to sensor interference is basically caused by when you take that laser light, project it out on the scene, and it, it bounces off of an object and comes back and is detected by that second sensor, causes noise in the data. So <clears throat> for the connects um, specifically, if you only use two sensors, you only have moderate amounts of interference. And this is because the modulation frequency is sitting there and randomly changing. So only when they're overlapping do you get interference. But if you want to use three or more, you'll end up having a lot of interference because odds are two of them will be at the same frequency. So something that you would traditionally do is you would just adjust the modulation frequency in the software to set them different for the different sensors. But Microsoft doesn't allow you to have access to these settings. So what we did is we um, just triggered with our own software that I'll talk about in a second. We, we trigger each sensor independently. So they're basically just in sequence. So again, the question that we wanted to see is can we use a low cost gaming sensor and replace that for the high quality expensive terrestrial laser scanner for doing plant phenotyping and could we do this in the field? So these, uh, these connect sensors, you know, they're designed for the Microsoft Xbox actually. They're definitely not made to go outdoors so we needed to create a platform to be able to do so. So um, this platform we made from widely available parts. So we used three of the Microsoft Connect sensors along with a lithium ion battery tied to a pure sine wave inverter. And we did this so that we could just power everything at 120 volts. And then we used uh, Latte Panda single board computers to run the software and to run the Connect sensors and store all the data. So these Latte Panda single board computers um, there's a lot of uh, newer versions out, but three years ago they were on their first iteration. It was the Latte Panda version one, as they call it now. So um, it has four gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of memory. But um, the important parts is that it runs Windows 10 and it has a USB 3.0. So these are two requirements in order to be able to run the Connect sensors. And as far as the frames, so. Um, we have the, the platform itself and then the, sense, the mounts that we use to hold the sensors. So we, cur we built these ourselves, but you could definitely have a local fab shop build them for you. <clears throat> and then on top of the hardware, we had to create some software to be able to run the platform. So um, we called this the Scorpion web application. And it's based on the uh, Microsoft Room Alive toolkit. It was built in C Sharp using the Connect SDK. And then the GUI was built in ReactJS. Basically what this allowed us to do is take any web enabled device, so you could take a laptop or a cell phone, anything like that, we just use a cell phone, connect to uh, the platform, basically be able to turn it off, turn it on, restart it if it had some problems, capture data, visualize that data in the field, and then store it. So for around $2,500 we were able to build this system. It should be noted that the most expensive thing here is the lithium ion battery. It was 700 bucks. We wanted that because it, it saved a lot of weight, but you could just use a car battery and save yourself $500. So now that we had our platform, we needed a place to test it. So we figured we should take it down to South America <laughs> and, uh, and test it on cassava. So we, we went to the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, or what is known as CIOT. It's outside of Cali, Colombia, and uh, we tested it on cassava. So um, the study, we looked at five different cassava varieties over nine age groups. But for the results I have done thus far on this, uh, we only looked at two varieties across four ages, so a total of 14 plants. 
And to give you an idea of how the, uh, the structure contrasted between the two varieties, on the left you can see the very traditional shrub type variety cassava, and then the more interesting or unique shaped cassava, which is known as the, an asparagus type on the right. So one of the major problems you have when you're analyzing 3D data is overlapping canopy. So if you, if you want to go in and segment out or get information about individual plants and they have overlapping canopies, that can be really difficult. So just to kind of combat this, we went in in the, in the plots and we actually cleared out all the plants that we weren't going to capture data on before we went in. And we also, <clears throat> we also needed something to compare the the platform too. So we, we compared it to the more traditional uh, terrestrial laser scanner. So we used a Trimble TX5, which is very similar to that Ferrofocus I mentioned before. Cost you about $25,000 uh, used. Um, some of the kind of highlights of it, it has a ranging error of about plus or minus two millimeters. So it's, it's pretty accurate and it functions at a wavelength of 905 nanometers. So terrestrial laser scanners in general are known for being able to produce a very high quality, high resolution point cloud. But with this comes that, that heavy price tag, but also they're slow because they're using a scanning function to capture their data. And because of this, if there's a lot of movement in the scene or really any movement in the scene at all, so in our case it would be from wind blowing the plants around, it can cause a lot of noise. So I thought it'd be good to talk about some of the key differences between the two different platforms. So the, um, the connect sensor basically works by projecting laser light into the scene. But really what it is, is it's a dot pattern that it projects out. And it's measuring the time of flight for each one of those dots in order to determine the distance. So it's kind of working like a flash LIDAR, if you've heard of that. Uh, while the terrestrial laser scanner is working in a in a scanning function. So it's basically sending out a packet of light, waiting for that to come back, and then adjusting itself in the azimuth and zenith, and doing that very quickly. Um, because of this, the, the connect sensors, you can, you can capture one data set very quickly, so just a few seconds, where the terrestrial laser scanner, depending upon the settings and everything that you use, for the settings that we used, it took about five minutes per scan. So um, as we already talked about a bunch, the connect is definitely a lot cheaper. However, in its current form, it, you, it required two people to be able to take it through the field. Where the terrestrial laser scanner, you basically just set it up and hit the go button, which is nice. Um, the range is definitely restricted for the connect sensors versus the terrestrial laser scanner. And you get a less dense point cloud with the connects. Both sensors definitely have their issues uh, or their environmental susceptibility. So the, the connect is, um, limited in full sun where the terrestrial laser scanner has issues in, in windy conditions. So to overcome these environmental factors, we actually captured the data at night. Um, so we collected data basically on uh, the north and south side of each plant, so at 180 degrees from each other. And we stuck metal stakes in the image basically to be able to allow us to tie the two data sets together. So all the analysis was done manually, uh, and it was done mostly using open source software. So I'll just kind of hit a couple of the highlights there. So we did manual registration, which is basically taking the two point clouds that you get using um, common points in there and tying those two together so that you get a 3D representation. Um, then uh, we did noise reduction using a statistical outlier removal tool, which is available in Cloud Compare, which is an open source 3D analysis software. And then one of the final steps we would have taken would be the manual clipping of individual plants. So we're basically removing all the points that were coming from other plants or uh, from the ground. So and that basically gives you something like you see here. So with the <clears throat> with the tremble. Um, you have the two varieties on the left-hand side, and then the two point clouds on the right-hand side um, were formed with the connect. And my apologies, but they should be spinning. I don't know that enough. So for the analysis, we just did a simple linear regression. Uh, along the x, what these values are is basically the number of points in the point cloud for each one of those plants, right? So it's just kind of like a point density. 
And then on the right is the total dry weight in grams. So for the terrestrial laser scanner, um, it did a pretty good job of predicting biomass. So we had an R squared of 0.85 with a root mean square error of about 113 grams. And a little bit to our surprise, the Connect actually did a little bit better. So we had an R squared of 0.88 with a root mean square error of about 98 grams. So when we have some some ideas of why this may have been. And I think the most probable cause is the fact that we just had more viewpoints. Because of the connect sensors, um, there were three of them, right? So from each side of the plant, you were getting three different viewpoints. With the terrestrial laser scanner, you were only getting one. So this led to less occlusion or less shadowing in the data. So just a, basically a better representation of the plant. However, um, you know, the the winds weren't perfectly still while we were collecting data, so occasionally you would see flickering of leaves and things like that. So that may have played a role in the degradation of the data we captured with the terrestrial laser scanner. So on top of finishing the, the rest of those varieties, the analysis basically, we've also collected very similar data on napier grass, which we'll be analyzing in the coming months. And something else that we're interested in doing is creating a semi-autonomous semi robot to help carry these uh, connect sensors and, as well as other sensors through the field. And something else that we'd like to do is um, have sensors which we can use to measure the wind and ambient light levels so that we can kind of control for those factors that are degrading the quality of the data that we're capturing. So uh, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Michael Silveros, so he was the, the head of the project at, at CI. Of course, uh, my advisor, Dr. Hayes. Um, Milton Valencia, he's the head of the, all the field work there, and uh, you know, he was a pivotal part of this project. And then some of, you know, this is only a couple of the people in our lab, but uh, they all played pivotal roles. So we have Tyler Adams, who's here today, Henry Ruiz, and then y'all probably, at least some of y'all know, Alfredo Delgado. Uh, he also had a lot to do with the field design, et cetera. And then this picture that you see here on the bottom right is really just only a handful of the people who made it happen. So thank you very much, and uh, take any questions you may have. Hey. Uh, how did you come with this optimal number of uh, like three, like yeah. Yeah. There's really no, there's really no optimum number. I mean, it really just depends upon how far away you want to be from the object, right? Because each of them have a field of view. So, you know, if you're willing to be four meters away and you're, you know, you're capturing a fairly small object, you could just have one sensor. Um, but we just went with three because it, it was probably the, you know. I guess it was just the easiest to carry around, right? If we had four or five or six, the thing would get pretty heavy. So that was probably really why we chose to go with three. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm not a plant breeder. So the number that you were demonstrating for the accuracy of the system, how, I'm assuming that this is hopefully for phenotyping in the future for large scale phenotype assays. Yeah. How accurate do you, need to keep, do you need to get before it's a tool that you would be willing to use on yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a pretty good, I guess it's, you know, depends upon the exact goal. I mean, I think a lot of, when you look at remote sensing in general, when they apply it to agriculture, even like a 0.5 or 0.6 is considered pretty decent, you know. So I think this is pretty good at, at 0.88. And actually, it could be uh, improved, I think. So, so what are you going to start charging $80,000 for? It? Yeah. yeah. No, actually, we're going to, um, we plan to put all this up for free. So. Yeah. yeah, including the software and everything. I think you were first, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I saw that you had like above ground biomass data. Did you look at the root? Yeah, we have it. We have it. We'll, we'll compare it. So like something else that probably a lot of y'all are aware of, we're doing GPR. So yeah. So we'll, we'll be comparing that data. It turns out that the data from that GPR was was average. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to follow up on that question. I think the precision is quite important here, right? So, I mean, you talked about it in terms of R-squared, but what about in terms of the science? Like, 
what what kind of uh, precision do you need to be able to tell the difference between peanuts? Mm. So that's uh, the goal, right? Yeah. The goal is not to match a 3D scanner. The goal is the peanut time. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that there's a hope that there will be a correlation between the above ground biomass in relation to the below ground. So, you know, I think, um, especially if you were early in your trials, right, 0.88 is probably good enough to allow you to, to be able to pick certain varieties and continue them forward, right? So if you were doing it on a large 0.88. scale, an R squared of 0.88. Yeah. And are, yeah, but what does this mean in like the units? So it's, the, it's just how well it correlates yeah, to got, the it. field, the field taken measure of biomass, right? right? Yeah. But how much? Okay, so there must be an RMSE involved in this in units of you, that you measure the biomass. Yeah. And what is the what is the um, you know if you measured a unit of root change? What's the associated unit of biomass change with that root change, and is yeah, that within we, the error? Yeah, we haven't looked. I haven't. I haven't analyzed that. That's data. the question, right? Yeah, That's I agree the with you. Important one yeah. to decide if this technology is worth pursuing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, as far as the use, of, yeah, as far as in the use of cassava, but mm -hmm. you know, biomass is something that is measured quite extensively in a lot of different crops, well, right? Well, so that's why reporting this in RMSV versus in R-squared would be actually more useful to scientists coming from a different crop, right? Because yeah. they know what range they're talking about. Yeah, so, I mean, I did have the root mean squares. So, I'm sorry. Keep this on working. Yeah. But what's, what's the unit? Grams? Grams, yeah. Yeah, I, 113 grams and about 99 grams. So 113 grams over... A range of what? Yeah, Zero thousand, grams to a thousand, thousand grams. grams. Yeah. So you're at ten percent. Yeah. So your RPD is what? Don't know. Yeah, because usually these things, you know, you talk about the RPD, which is the standard deviation in mean, and so that you can um, you can scale your RMSE, and usually in different um, disciplines, the RPD kind of tells you different disciplines have different thresholds of RPD. So you might look into that and see what your RPD threshold is and report that. Okay. Really, in this case, the, the weak part of the regression is the, is the biomass weight. In most cases, that's, for these that's kind of what data. the RPD tells you. Right. Uh, so yeah, just because he hasn't gone yet. So uh, you you showed features of two very different yeah. varieties, I guess. Yeah. 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 And everything. I was just wondering if you uh, did uh, any analysis on these angles. Because uh, it looked like they were yeah, no, very we colored, have. and then the other one is kind of more sparse, and then if you could extract any information. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did, I, yeah, I haven't collected any data on leaf angle. I did do like a leaf area study, but I haven't analyzed that data yet. Did you see the leaf angle in your? I don't, yeah, I don't think so, not with the connects. With the terrestrial laser scanner, um, if you collect high resolution data, you can see, especially with cassava leaves, because they're pretty big. Yeah. So you, you cleared up the field this last plant air, and then you came on unit shift, or just yeah. normally the way it is yeah, for you to go through the field. Yeah. Is this going to work for three o'clock? Yeah, I think it will. It's just that, that I think that we need to develop the algorithms to be able to automatically extract the individual plants. So, I mean, this is like forestry is really where terrestrial laser scanning came from, um, you know, as far as like an agricultural type field, right? And that's one of the main problems that they're working on. And they're working on much larger scale, right? Where they can have much lower quality data to be able to then have algorithms which will extract individual trees. Um, would be very difficult. Yeah, it is, but it, you know, but there's been a lot of progress in there. So you know, I, I mean, I hate that. I, I've seen some talks on that, and they, they basically, each plant will move slightly differently, and they use that information to segregate the plants when you're collecting the data. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's like, there's inherent um, geometric laws in the way that individual certain types of trees or certain types of plants grow, and they use those 
as uh, as tools to be able to basically map the structure of plants so that then you can segment them. Yeah. And then if it's if you're using different species, then you can use things like reflectance and things like that to pull them out. But yeah, I think you. Maybe had that was my question about leaf angle measurements. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Why did you choose the Microsoft software over the Sony? And did you expect there to be any differences between those two platforms? Yeah, to be honest, I really, you know, it was like three years ago, and I don't remember exactly what the pitfalls were. But at the time, you know, we looked at basically what was widely available, and it was the one that kind of met our needs. I, my guess is, is that the, the, a lot of the other manufacturers, most of them, they wouldn't perform well outdoors, and that was the limiting factor. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.